Welcome to the Uncomfortable is OK podcast. Today, I am joined by Ant Williams. Ant was referred to me by a previous guest of the podcast, Belinda Morgan. And as soon as she mentioned what Ant was all about, I was like, oh, this guy sounds, he sounds good. So Ant is a leadership development expert. He runs his own company in the space. He is a freediver, a previous world champion freediver, which is a, is a crazy sport to, to think about if you're not familiar with it. And he spent a lot of his career as well, working as a performance psychologist with elite athletes and with organizations as well. And mate, it's a pleasure to have a chat with you today. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, mate, it's a pleasure to be here, Chris. Unfortunately, I've never been world champion. I've tried very hard. I did get a world record one a world couple record. of years ago. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but no, that's okay. Just, I just, yeah. You world take, champions just, always escaped me. Just take that one, mate. Take that one. And I like to ask people just to start off with, like, mate, where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in West Auckland. So Teatatu, Henderson, that area. Yeah, just had a fantastic upbringing. Pretty down and real in West Auckland, I think, in the period of time that I grew up out that way, but I uh, have very strong ties to that area. Yeah. How old, how old are you, mate? Mate, I'm 50. 50. Okay. Yep. Nice. Yeah. I know. I don't look a day over 30, no, right? You don't. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> Max 30. I was also born in West Auckland and lived in Swanson for a little bit. Oh. So I'm a, I'm 39. So. But I probably delivered you a mail when I did the posty run. You might've done. You might've done. It was a, it was a cool area around that time, wasn't it? It sure was back in the day. And thinking back to kind of growing up, are there any, th are there any things that you can think of that may have shaped the, the path that you've taken in your life? Oh yeah. A number of things. I think the number one thing that shaped the path that I took in, in, in ending up wanting to participate in an extreme sport was, was feeling like as a, as a, as a young like an adolescent guy in West Auckland that, that I felt like my experiences were being really shaped by my family environment and my context. And and my family were right into religion. We were, we were like Baptist church members and, and doing the right thing, playing it safe, thinking about others and community and putting them first was, were all the hallmarks of, of my upbringing, like spending a lot of time in the church environment. And I always saw myself as someone who was quite risk at first, played it safe, stayed on the rails. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. And like growing up, what did that, what did that risk adver aversion look like for you? Can you give us some examples? I think it was, it started out as a healthy respect for things that terrified me, like Oh, like I love surfing, but I never wanted to go on waves that were of consequence and kind of wanted to get past that fear. It was also like West Auckland when I grew up, look, it was at its moments that were pretty, pretty rough and tumble at school and, and being a, a kid that played rugby growing up, like I got into my fair share of altercations, not for me seeking them out, but just because that was, I think West Auckland at the time that I grew up and always feeling terrified. <laughs> around confrontation because I couldn't talk my way through it. I, I certainly didn't have the skills to fight my way out of it and, and really felt that I wanted to know how to be more confident and composed in moments where I was under pressure, but I never learned it. I never figured it out. I just thought it was something you were either born with or you weren't. And so you're either going to be a victim or maybe a bully, but, <laughs> but that was the path was chosen for you. Yeah. I think that's a. It's kind of a common theme as well, is that it people view it as something that's innate within us, isn't it? That you either have it or you don't. And it's probably only recently that we've started to respect it a little bit more as a, as a skill set. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I spent the large part of my time at university looking at exactly this question around when it comes to that confidence in when you, in those moments where you're placed under pressure and that could look different for everyone, right? It could be for some that's placed under pressure is I've got to deliver a speech on stage for someone else. It's I've just got to tell a good friend that she's really pissing me off at the moment and that I don't feel confident having that conversation. So I mean, it looks different for everyone, but those skills around being able to sit in discomfort, be okay with it and have the skills and the competence to navigate it is such a vital social skill and life skill that I think everyone 
needs to know that it can be learned. And there's some very simple steps that you can take to learn those skills and learn them very effectively. Mm. And when you, when you decided to go down your university training in psychology, was that to kind of, again, kind of scratch your own itch and learn how to better put yourself in those situations yourself? No, not at all. All I wanted to do was hang out with athletes and, and be around sport. I was pretty crap at sport. Um, I know I played rugby and surfing, but I was dreadful at them, <laughs> Sorry. but I did love them. And that was the thing about I mean, my mother said to me one day, oh, you know what you should study and you should, you should go and study sport because you really love it. You're not very good at it, but you love it. So go on. And so I did, I went down to Otago university and I studied sport for four years. And it's, that's when I found out about this thing called sports psychology. And the early days, you know, back in the nineties and sports psychology wasn't really much of a thing back there. And when I figured out that just by working in the top two inches, like that whole mental toughness piece, you could literally change how someone performs and make a significant difference in their overall ranking. I just became fascinated by it. And, and yeah, it's just that, that from that point forward, it was all about me learning those skills to teach others. And at some point I just kind of figured out that maybe I needed to apply some of those to myself too. Yeah. How long had you been working as a sports psychologist before you came to that realization? Like seven years. <laughs> I'm not a fast starter. Chris. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we were, we were talking about me beforehand as well, and it took me 15 years to, <laughs> to kind of step out on my own away from working as a physio in a clinic. But I guess Ant, like for you during that time period, that seven years, like, did you have some internal dissonance going on? with, Hey, I'm teaching all of these people, these skills, but potentially I'm not applying them to my own life as well. Oh, I think it was even more brutal than that. I had a realization one day that I was a complete fraud because I, I was working in elite motorsport. I was working in athletes in MotoGP, which is like the formula one of motorcycle racing in the world. I was traveling around, tra traveling around the globe with this team and realizing that the athletes that I'm working with. They are weapons out on the racetrack. And here am I teaching them stuff. It's all from a textbook. I have no lived experience. I'm, everything I'm teaching them comes from somebody else. Who am I really to be training these guys? And that dawned on me and it hit me hard. I thought I haven't succeeded even in a regular sport, let alone a dangerous sport. And pretty much by this stage, all of my athletes were doing dangerous sports, big wave surfing, base jumping, speed skiing, cage fighting, rally driving, motor, motocross and all, all the stuff and, and look, it's just not my background. And so the only rational conclusion I could reach was that I needed to go and apply the same principles that I was teaching others to myself. And I needed to find a sport that would allow me to do it, not to have the goal to be a, a world conqueror in the sport, but simply so that I could sit down with someone like you, Chris, and go, okay, so Chris, tell me what's going on now. Cause the race is tomorrow. And you could say, oh, Ant, I feel like this, and I'm worried about that on the starting grid. And then I would be in a position to go, Chris, I know what you mean. I have the same thing in my sport. I can relate to that. Let me tell you what I would do. That's what I was seeking. Mm, cool. And did you choose seeking challenge in a sport because it would make you make it easier to relate to the athletes that you were working with, as opposed to choosing a challenge and potentially a different avenue of life? Yeah, I knew it had to be in a sport and I figured it should be in a more extreme sport. So I looked around and there were three sports that, that caught my eye when I was living in the South of France, there was bullfighting, there was wingsuit flying, or there was free diving. They all kind of like just rated very high on the extreme scale for me at the time. And being an ocean lover, I picked free diving. Yeah. Was that the only reason you picked free diving? I think so. Maybe it was because it was lesser of the three evils. I don't know, but just for, a lot of people don't know what freediving is. So let me just quickly yeah. explain what it is. It's not jumping off cliffs into the water. A lot of people think it's that. What I do is I go out into the ocean, into very deep water. We run ropes down and place tags at the bottom of those ropes. And the challenge is to see who can swim down unassisted all the way to the bottom of those ropes on a single breath of air, retrieve a tag and make it back to the surface without blacking out. Which. I, for the people that don't know, it's pretty intense. Had you done much diving beforehand before you thought, ah, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have a crack at free diving. 
never, I didn't, I'd never done a dive, not scuba, maybe a bit of snorkeling, but I didn't know how to equalize. So, so no. Yeah. So what was the process for you then going and starting a sport like that? <laughs> it was pretty fun. I, the process was I just went and joined a local freediving club because freediving over in, in Europe, especially in the South of France is a big popular sport. It's not here, but back over there, it was pretty popular. So I just went and joined a local club and I started freediving and training with them. I was no better than anyone. In fact, I was like the worst of the bunch, but I found that by applying the things that I was teaching others to myself, it, it gave me a massive advantage but because here's the thing with freediving, there's so much fear involved. There's a fear of suffocation when you're deep underwater and you can't draw a breath. There's a fear of being out in the open ocean where you're sinking all by yourself into deep black water and you're being crushed on the way down, physically crushed by that water pressure. And there's no escape. You can't just bail out and grab a breath of air when you're that deep. You've just got to deal with it and accept the, the discomfort and the intense loneliness that comes with a dive. And so for that reason, if you're mentally tough, you can be very successful in this sport. Mm. Yeah. I think obviously it's, um, there's a lot of physical capacity that you need to build over time as well to, to get to the, the depths that you do. So what was your, what was your world record? That was, so that was a, an attempt that I made to become the deepest man under ice. And we traveled, I got a, a team and we traveled high up into the Arctic circle to a place called Kirkenes. It took us nine hours to cut one hole in the ice because it was 1.3 meters thick. The outside air temperature was minus 36 degrees. And my challenge was to break the, the world record that was set by a Russian of, of 65 meters straight down under the ice. How long had you been free diving before you decided, Hey, this sounds like a good idea. Let's go and try this. Okay. Yeah, I'd already been freediving for 20 years at this stage, competitively, internationally. And the reason that, that I went to take that on is because I just felt bored with, with trying, with my goal every year being to go to four more competitions, see if I can get a meter or two deeper or go a little bit further in the pool. It just wasn't that exciting for me anymore after 20 years of it. So I was looking for a new challenge and I thought, you know, what would be really interesting to keep going with this theme around testing my limits, learning how to become a, a, a risk taker and doing, doing it in a safe, but positive way. So I want to go out to the fringe of my sport. So I thought, well, where would the fringe of an already extreme sport be? It would probably be doing it under ice. Um, so everything snowboard, excuse the pun from there. Nice mate. And to, <laughs> to bring it back, to loop it back to right, right at the start when you were beginning to free dive. What were helpful mental tools that you used as you started to go deeper and started to put yourself in more uncomfortable situations? Well, I'll share with you first what impact I, I, I was, what, what the consequence was of doing deeper dives gradually when I was early on in the freediving career. So what I was finding is that I'd go down to new depths and I would be terrified. I'd be terrified before the dive, during the dive. And that would often lead to one or two things, me panicking on the way down, uh, and aborting the dive or me creating a whole sense of catastrophe in my own mind. That would mean it was a very uncomfortable, unpleasant experience that I wouldn't want to repeat. So for that reason, what I would find is that I would get a whole lot of negative self-talk happening from way before the dive, sometimes days before where I'd say, shit, I don't know if I can do this. I hope. I hope everything goes well and I don't run out of air down there. What if I black out? And then I would obsess on these things and they would ruminate in my head. And then on the dive itself, you know, I'd be descending and my brain would be saying to me, doesn't feel right today. Mm, this is bad. I think something bad's happening. I think I didn't get enough air. I think I should turn. All these things would be in my head and they would cause me to have terrible dive experiences. And look, I'm sharing this because I think all of us have this when we do things that are uncomfortable. We have that voice on our shoulder that, that says, you suck at this and it's going bad. So the first thing I did is I learned how to reframe. It's a sports like technique where you take the things that you're saying to yourself that aren't programmed in and you rewire your brain to say something different on a dive. And so for me, it might just be relax and, and, and just be really fluid. It might be things like, 
uh, just enjoy this, uh, enjoy this, the, the sink phase, which is when I just don't have to kick anymore. I just glide down into the depths and I'd have things that, that would really motivate me as well. Like when I turn at the bottom, I, I scream at myself, go, 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 which is kind of this cool. Now we get to swim back up and, and these small little things that I would be able to say to myself at each stage would automatically trump any negative voice and just that tiny little tweak on its own made a big difference in how I perform under pressure. And were you able to apply those straight away when you started utilizing them? Because I met, like I've, I've never dived deep, probably the, the deepest I've gone is about 10 meters to kind of grab some shellfish off the bottom there. And by the time you've been down and you've looked for a few shellfish and you're like, shit, I need to get up right now. I don't know that I would be able to, I haven't tried, but I don't know that I would be able to flick that mental switch that quickly. Yeah. I, I think they say that mental toughness skills are like physical skills and that they take a long, a lot of practice and effort to, to build competence at them. And I'd say for me, that one technique would have taken me several months to, to, to get a good grasp on it. And then over the years, I'd say I've got, I've got a, a form of mastery of it. And, and that enables me to deal with a lot more pressure before those dives when there's maybe like a hundred people watching you, for example, and, and you've got a countdown and on zero, you have to go on that, on that right in those few seconds. So it needs to be pretty fine tuned by then. And then looking back, so that was, that was one that you did utilize looking back now with all of your experience, would you have given yourself any different advice when you were starting out that you think may have been helpful for you? I did get some good advice when I was getting started that, that, yeah, I would say to other athletes who were in my same position or other people wanting to improve their skills is go and get coaching early, really good coaching. Like, for example, I know a lot of people who love surfing, who have been surfing most of their lives, but have never got coaching. I go, and you're missing a trick here. Like the best thing about sports is seeing improvement and building of skills so that you can perform things better. Um, but if you don't get a coach that you don't get the benefit of someone giving you rapid feedback every time you practice, you just have to rely on your ability to, to learn and figure it out as you go. And I did that for years, just figuring it out as I was going. And it means that your progress isn't nearly as fast. So I know it's a pretty simple one, but mm -hmm. if you've got a goal around whatever th that goal might be around, is there a way to fast track your, your progress through, through some coaching? Yeah. Very good point actually. And I think. Like especially as, as Kiwis, we're, we've kind of grown up with this number eight wire mentality as well as like, oh, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it ourselves. We'll give it a go. And sometimes we're a bit shit at kind of reaching out for, reaching out for help or reaching out for support to, to progress us more quickly as well. So thank you for kind of framing it up and in that way, hopefully that makes it, it makes it helpful for at least one person to stick their hand up and say, ah, oh, I can do a bit better here if I had a little bit more support. Yeah, I hope so. Honestly, I think it's no different for those, for those, uh, those skills that we're talking around, around moments where you've got to perform under pressure. So for example, if I was wanting to become a speaker and speak up on a stage, then I could do the Kiwi thing, which is just go and get some experience, crank up the notches. But if I get the experience and I don't get the feedback, uh, or, and I don't have some support from a coach, it's just going to be a harder path and it's going to take me longer. Yeah. So you are a speaker and you get up on stage as yeah. well. Did you, again, did you do the Kiwi thing and just get up there yourself to start with? Or did you, no. did you seek a coach early on? And I sought coaching. So there you go. I listened to my own advice occasionally, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I tell well, people things sometimes and I'm like, oh shit, I should really take yeah. that forward. <laughs> I know. So no, I was in New Zealand at the time. I started freediving and I was doing multiple trips each year to compete on the international scene for freediving. And it was costing me a fortune. And I'd heard about keynote speaking and, and these keynote speakers that can earn an absolute mozza from talking for 20 minutes. So I was like, man, that's got that. This is just a, a gold mine. I want to go and do that. So I did a year of Toastmasters training and then I went and got my first gig. It just happened that my very first gig was through an agency called Celebrity Speakers. They got me to speak for Telecom New Zealand on a massive stage in like 
the town hall speaking up to the mayor, John Banks, and I was terrified. <laughs> How did yeah? How, how did that compare to to freediving? Like, were you using exactly the same strategies that you use when you're in the water as you were on stage, or was there or was there some different stuff that you needed to do? I, I was using the same strategies. So I was using reframing. I was using my number one go to technique, which is centering, which is around slowing down your breathing, bringing your energy focus back internally and affirmations just around the fact that this is going to be a lot of fun. You just got to enjoy it and embracing the nerves that come with it. So yes, I was using a lot of those same techniques and I actually loved the experience of it because I look at it objectively and I go, that looks bloody terrifying. I had to speak to 750 people the first time I've ever spoken to an audience and someone was paying me for it. So if it was bad, it was all just terrible, but it's amazing. You know, if you, if you can just stay really relaxed and composed and and have that voice within you that just says, it's going to be okay. Trust yourself. Whatever happens, you're going to be fine. And that's the whole essence of bravery. It begins with belief, belief that you can handle whatever's going to come your way. And if you go into something like that first talk on a stage with that mindset and, and it enables you to relax, then you're able to access all that higher level thinking in your brain that gives you the ability to deliver, remember what you're going to say and then deliver it in an expert way. It's when we don't do those things and the tension arises, the self-doubt creeps in, the, the wanting to just back out of our challenge hits us and, and then we get onto the stage and we don't, now we're emotionally caught up in our internal state and we can no longer access that rational intellectual side of things. And that's why people say, I got up on stage and my mind went blank and I couldn't say anything. And that's, that's simply because of what happened in the five minutes in the lead up of not being able to contain and, and use their nerves and their anxiety for, for a positive way. They, they let them you know, really pull down their performance. Mm. So you've, you've talked about reframing and you've, you talked about centering. And I think I, I understand those concepts reasonably well. And you also talked about affirmations as well. Can you explain to us a little bit more about how you think about affirmations and how you utilize them? Yeah, look, I think affirmations, the idea of affirmations has been around for a while and look, they, they can be quite helpful to, to guide you and how, how you want to feel and experience the world on a, in any given day. Do you know what I mean? So here's, here's what I mean. If you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, I've had a terrible sleep. Kids get me up or the dog woke me up early or the neighbor's dog was barking and you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, I've got that meeting today and I don't want to go to it. And I just, I just wish I could stay in bed and everything that you're saying to yourself is around, this is going to be a lousy day, then usually that's self-fulfilling. Whereas if you start a day, and so I, I get a number of my athletes to do this in the week before competition, they have a card by their bed and they read it at night and they read it in the morning. And it says things like, you've trained harder than any of your competitors. You deserve to place in the top five in this event. You're going to have an, an incredible week because you're, you're now at your peak, just things like this. And I might be four or five things that they read and usually ones around posture. Right? And I'll say, you need to walk with your chin up and your shoulders back this week because you own this and, and you're ready. And it's things like this, where it's a little bit emotively tinged. And when you read it, you go, hell yeah. And so when I read it before bed, what I'm doing is I'm pre-programming what I want my, my subconscious to ruminate on over as I sleep. And then I get up in the morning and I remind it and I go, that's how I'm starting my day on these affirmations. And it might sound really simple, but it's, it's, it's quite powerful. And the reason I do include the ones around the posture is that I want people to change their posture uh, as athletes before they perform right from a week out. If you try to, if you were to walk around for a day, slouching, hunching over, looking down, looking at your phone all day long, it, it the, the, the signals that your body is sending back to your brain are, are, are screaming at your brain that you don't feel confident, that you're, that you're unwell, that you're not feeling strong. All these signals, the, the signals from body to brain are very, very powerful. So I tell my athletes, walk around like you own the joint from the moment you get out of bed with positive posture, breathing, gait, all these things, and part of your positive affirmation in order to perform well on any given day. And there's been studies on this stuff. It's, it could be very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And from a, a physio perspective as well, I 
completely agree with that postural piece as well. And I was having a chat with a, a conversation with a guy the other day and I was just, I said to him, I was like, Hey, look, you're, you know, how kind of your, your mental health affects and your mental state affects your posture when you're not feeling well, you hunch, you, you come into this defensive posture, your shoulders go up, your, your fists get tight. And it, it, it works back the other way as well. It works, it works and just as you described. And I, I said to him, I was like, mate, just real interesting thing. It's like one day a week, I always noticed that I felt a little bit more anxious than others. And I don't know, maybe I'm getting you to, to do a little bit of a therapy session on me here. And I was like, why is that? What is going on on that one day? And then I thought about what, what was happening and what I was doing. And what I'd realized is that I'd done like a push day at the gym the day before. So I'd worked on, I'd worked on a lot of kind of bench press and flies uh, among other things as well. And so my pecs were tight, which protracted my shoulders, brought me forward, meant that I had to kind of extend my neck. And I was like, actually, Hey, that's putting me in that posture and pulling me forward. So the, the stress that I kind of the the challenges that I have the next day, I tend to be more anxious around them potentially because I'm in this posture. So what I've started doing is like when I do a push day, I'll do a little bit of extra mobility work that afternoon so that hopefully I'm a little bit looser the next day that I'm not as tight and I don't feel, don't feel as gnarly in my mental and emotional state. That is awesome. What a, what a great connection to make realizing that your muscle tightness caused you to but posture changed and that's affected your mood. That, that's quite a remarkable realization. It's, it, it's taken a, it's taken a lot of time and a lot of body awareness to, for that <laughs> to find a click for me. I'm like, oh, that's probably what's going on there. But, and we, I, I want to get into, to some of the meaty stuff. Like free diving is scary. The consequences of things going wrong with it are high and yet you keep going back to it and you, and it's, but it's given you so much in your life as well. How do you think about kind of managing that risk compared to the benefits that it, that it creates for you? Well, when I look at freediving, I think it's easy to look at a, a sport like freediving and quickly come to the conclusion that it's a very dangerous sport. I mean, it's usually classified as a dangerous or an extreme sport, but I don't see it that way. And a lot of the athletes who compete in it do not see it that way either. I, I will concede that there's, there can be a lot of fear and discomfort in the sport. That, that's a given when you get into the sport, fear and discomfort. But in terms of real risk, as in physical harm, I competed for 22 years. I'm still alive and I've never had an injury. So for me, that tells me it's a, it's. It's a sport where you can, if you follow the rules in terms of what's required in order to stay safe, then you can actually do it in a very safe way. And the safety around the sport is only improving every year. And it's, it's amazing to see. So I, I feel like I do it in a safe way. And I feel that, that uh, it does give me an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of benefits by taking what I consider to be positive calculative risks. And I'll, let me explain what I mean by that. I feel that in society for a long time, we've been really <laughs> looking after everyone in this society as though it's the, it, it's not okay to take risk that we want to safeguard everyone and to keep everyone safe. A pandemic was a great example. Hey, there's a bug out there. It's terrifying. We're going to lock you all down in your, in your houses and you can't, can't leave because it, the government feels it's your responsibility. And, and we, as a public, we, we embrace that. And then I look on an even a smaller scale. I remember my daughter coming home to me one afternoon saying, Hey dad, I'm not allowed to run. There's a new rule. We're not allowed to run, allowed to run in the playground anymore at school. I said, what do you mean? The playgrounds for running. That's, that's the very definition of what I'm, having playtime is, is running around and playing. And she goes, no, we're not allowed to anymore in case someone trips up. And it, it just makes me think what happens is is we become a society that values protection and not wanting people to feel uncomfortable. When we do that as part of our culture, what happens or what I see in businesses, because I work with leaders, I see leaders who are afraid to take on positive risk and they are on the side of caution. And that can mean that they're 
afraid of change because they don't like discomfort. So they stick in their ways and that can massively hold an organization back. It means often that they're, they're too afraid to really innovate because they don't like to take risks and they don't like to make mistakes. And so the whole perpetuation of this idea of we need to stay comfortable and we shouldn't take on too many risks it actually causes us great harm. Now, I'm not an advocate for thrill seeking, which is just throw out all the rules, have a crack at everything, see what sticks and hopefully make it through unscathed. That's different. That's, that's uneducated risk taking. But positive calculated risk taking is essential. Like how can you achieve, achieve anything in life, any significant challenge to overcome that's meaningful in your life without taking on risk? I don't think you can. Therefore, we just simply need to get better at identifying what risks are worth taking and get better at managing our emotional state through them. I completely agree. I think you've just kind of summarized what this podcast is all about. If we're thinking about kind of taking positive calculated risks, how do we get strategic about the ones that are worthwhile for us to pursue? Yeah, that's a good question because I think there's such an array of risks. There's financial risk, there's risk, physical risk, there's risk to equipment or resources. There's all these different types of risks that we have, but there's also ways of looking at risk. So there's, there's this thing that we call as perceived risk, which is, oh, that looks risky. I better be very careful. I better not do it. But in reality, it's not actually that dangerous. I put free diving under that, that category. <laughs> then you've got things that have absolute risk, which is if you do this thing, you're probably going to get injured or there'll be an adverse outcome. And so it's actually really being, getting good at at evaluating risk and deciding whether it's worth taking on. I mean, we do that in life when we decide if we're going to buy a house or a car and, and usually it's, there's this way up of our emotional reaction, our gut visceral response to a risk. And what we know is that often people overestimate the consequences negatively and undervalue the positive upswing of it. So we tend to be more afraid of something bad happening to us and we 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 over calculate towards this then we do the positive outcome of taking the risk mm. how can we start to reframe that idea in our mind so that we're not kind of burdened by the the potential negative outcome that we can maybe adopt a more realistic approach i'll give you my favorite way of doing this it's called playing worst case scenario. So worst case scenario is, okay, let me give you an example from free diving. Okay. So I want to nominate a dive and I'm going to dive down to 80 meters tomorrow in this competition. And if I do it, it's going to have all these great outcomes, but I quickly forget what those great outcomes are. And I obsess that, oh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be so uncomfortable. It could be dangerous. Something could go wrong. So what I do is I go, well, let's play worst case scenario. And then I'll game it out. So I'll go, worst case is that I black out on the way up. I go, okay, and what would happen if that, if that were the case, if that were true? And I go, okay, well, someone would like grab me, the safety free dive would grab me at, from 10 meters, they'd take me to the surface. There'd be a really good medical crew there who would look after me. And the worst case is that actually I, I, I didn't achieve the dive. You know, I got disqualified for blacking out. And then I go, well, was that really the worst case? Because not doing the dive in the first place, because I because I'm afraid of that, means that I don't get the dive either. So is that really the worst case? And the blackout, well, it doesn't hurt to be blackout. <laughs> I'm sure it's not healthy and I'll try to avoid it. But if that's the worst scenario, is it really that bad? And that's what we often find is that our worst case scenarios, if we were to think them through, we can actually come up with strategies to avoid it very successfully. Or actually that the worst case scenario isn't actually as bad as we thought. And, and I think sometimes that, that process of, of not giving ourselves that opportunity to rationalize worst case scenario means that we just hold it to be true and we're terrified of it. And so we don't take on the challenge. Yeah. That's a, that's a cool, that's a cool strategy. Kind of similar to, you're probably very familiar with the, the TED talk that Tim Ferriss gave on fear setting as well, which is that's another one that I love to, to, to utilize a little bit harder to do it quickly in the moment. 
Yeah, but I think if you were to say, so apply the example I gave of diving to 80 meters and apply it to one that we touched on earlier. Oh, I've got to give my friend some feedback that she's really been annoying me lately with this thing she's doing. Or, And then if I play worst case scenario, that I go, oh, this could really, if I gave her that feedback, it could damage my relationship with her. Now let's play that out. What if I didn't give her the feedback and then it caused me to pull away from her further? That would damage the relationship as well. And so, so you see what I mean? By playing worst case scenario, it actually can identify that some of our fears are misplaced. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And if someone if someone is thinking about, hey, I've got this, I've got this challenge that I would love to do, or I'd got I've got this thing that I that I want to do, but it's just far too scary for me to do right now maybe at some point in the future i could do that what kind of what kind of advice or what kind of energy would you suggest to them for kind of thinking about that and, and approaching it if that if it's something say, that is really meaningful to them okay i'd say then the the biggest risk at the moment is that you're in a category with 99 percent of other people who has a lofty goal but you're not ready to take the first step and when you don't take the first step, because that lofty goal is so lofty, you will always be facing that challenge of when should I take the first step? And for many, that will be debilitating and you'll never take that first step and you'll never get any closer. And you'll always see it as a, well, there wasn't, it was always such a lofty goal. Maybe it was never right for me anyway. So my advice would be, what's that one big thing? The one big thing that you can start doing immediately that would have minimal consequence to your lifestyle. It would only take you a small notch towards that goal, but it would be a stepping stone where you go, actually, I'm now on the road to that. It might be signing up for a, a class, getting a coach. It might be having that a first conversation or exploring something on the online or, or what that might look like for you, but take the first step. And once you take the first step, you'll be surprised that you'll go, gee, that first step was really easy and you'll have momentum. You can achieve, achieve goals, big lofty goals without momentum. And if you wait, that's what the 99% do. They wait. Don't be in that 99%. Yeah. And I think it's like when you look at it as a lofty goal and kind of compare that to where you are at the moment as well, it often seems really, really overwhelming that you see, wow, this is so far away. Here's where I am at the moment. I don't know what it looks like when I get up there and when I get close to it, but just like climbing a mountain, like you can see that first step and maybe the second step in front of you. And then kind of once you start to, to take that action and start to build a little mo bit of momentum, then actually more options and more knowledge opens up to you. So you can take that third step and that fourth step and slowly kind of work your way towards whatever it is that big thing is that you're, that you're chasing. There's a book that came out recently, oh, actually it was a few years ago now called by Keller, I forget his first name, called The One Big Thing. And his principle is that progression does not need to be linear towards a goal. It could be exponential. And that's been my experience as well, is that if you start by taking that first step and you choose that first step really carefully by focusing on what's the one big thing that's going to make a difference and you continue to do that, your growth can be exponential versus linear and it can get you to your goals much faster. And I want to give you a real example of that. When I first started trying to hold my breath, I could not get past two minutes. And over the weeks, I would get like a couple of seconds past two minutes or two minutes, oh, five, maybe get up to two minutes, 10 after a month of trying. And then when I got coaching, I started doing regular practice in a club. Then over the coming weeks, I got to three minutes and then I got a better coach and I went to four minutes and then I went and competed on the world championship a year later and I placed third in the world. And it was because of, it was just the, the, the transition was exponentially greater and in no time I was holding my breath for up around seven or eight minutes. And, and, and people will look at that and they, in freediving, they go, oh, eight minutes is not many people that can do eight minutes. And you go, well, how'd you get there? It must take years and years. And you go, it doesn't have to. And that, that's the reality. Don't look at your challenges linear. It can be exponential, but you gotta plan this stuff out. You go, what are the big things? What's the one big thing I'm going to do first? And once you've, once you've ticked that off, go okay, now what's the next one big thing? Focus here is critical. That's where the secret is, is being, is doing really good critical thinking about what's going to get you there faster.
Mm. Great point. And if people have been enjoying this conversation and want to find out more about you and the work that you do, where can they do that? Uh, you can either follow me on Insta, so Freedive Guy on Insta, or you can jump on my website. So I run a company called Modus Leadership, M-O-D-U-S Leadership, and we're online. Or you can even just Google Ant Williams and you'll find a link to that pretty quick. And yeah, follow me there or on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well. For anyone who's interested on the leadership side of things, I post to LinkedIn quite frequently with advice, tips, and tricks up there. Even have my own podcast called The Leadership Deep Dive. There you go. See, more places. I, I like how you've done that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks for sharing that, mate. We'll, we'll link that all up in the show. But a couple of questions just to finish off for you, mate. How do you look after your health now? So I try, like, I, I look at the whole thing around aging and I feel that, again, as a society, we've got this innate belief that everything must slow down as you age and you start to let go of things, and including the amount of time you put towards physical exercise and your well-being. Whereas I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to increase the amount of time that I invest in it. So I'm trying to get in a position where I don't have four weeks holiday a year. I have 12, and I've been able to do that a couple of years now, and I'm, that's a goal that I'm working towards. And, and, and in that time is spent doing really active stuff. And then of course, week by week, then I'm still training three to four days. Actually, it's more likely four days a week where I'm training and I'm trying to get that up as well. Sure. The weights I move around might be less and how deep I dive in those training sessions might be a little less, but it's, for me, it's about getting variety. And I, and so I moved my family down the coast where we just have so many options for riding motorbikes, mountain bikes, getting out on the ocean, paddling stuff, that it just makes it a joy to go and exercise. And, and that's the thing, the number one thing I've learned over these years is if it's fun, the exercise is fun, you're more likely to do it. Uh, or if you can rope someone else in with you, even better. Yeah. I completely agree with that as well with my, with my physio hats on. People are way more likely to stick with, with things that are enjoyable than, than anything else that someone suggests that you might, that you should do. And final question for you, mate, is like, we've talked a lot about this already, but do you have any other strategies that are useful when you're approaching challenging situations or building your capacity to, to take on hard things? Oh, that's a good question. So a number of things jumped to mind, but I, I, the one I think I would like to share is just the importance of planning. And it's what separates a, a risk taker from a thrill seeker is thrill seekers just turn up, rock up, jump off that cliff, jump off that boulder, launch themselves out of that plane without really doing the planning. And they don't stick, stick around too long, the, but risk takers will be doing things that are really challenging, but they'll be so well planned. It's just that you don't see that planning. Doesn't mean it's not occurring. And so with my free diving, my planning is meticulous. It can take days, weeks, sometimes months to plan a dive. And no one sees that part of it, but it's the thing that keeps me alive and doing it well and doing it successfully. And so planning is key. And I've given the example earlier about even having a difficult conversation with someone can be something that requires discomfort and a bit of fear. And so take that as an example and go, well, how would you plan for that? Well, I would plan for a difficult conversation with a friend or a colleague at work by, by thinking about, well, what's my intention for this conversation? Like, what do I want to get out of it? What do I want them to get out of this conversation? And then I'll think, how will I frame it? So rather than maybe going in guns blazing saying, Chris, you've really pissed me off and I want to tell you why and you're to blame, then I might frame it different because I know that my intention is to actually enhance our relationships. I'll go, okay, what would my framing be? My framing might be, hey, Chris, I noticed this has happened between us the last few times we've caught up. And it's, I actually thought I'd better just mention it to you because you probably are feeling the same way. And so if, once I get the frame right, then I'm, all my confidence goes up. I go, wow, this might actually be quite an easy conversation to have after all. And that's a really meaningful one. And I wouldn't have got that if I hadn't planned. I would have just stormed into that meeting with you, Chris, and just given you a bollocking. And, and we teach these skills to leaders because they need to know how to do this. But actually, it applies to everyone. Everyone needs to know. 
in these times when we have to have something that requires us to sit in some discomfort, a bit of planning goes a long way. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ant. And thank you so much for getting uncomfortable with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show.